thank you so much for having me speak here today. And Lisa, thank you so much for the word that you shared in the beginning. I think that's really set the basis and the foundation for what I'm going to be talking about today, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I also just want to take a moment just to honour you for everything that you do, because it's not easy. <laughs> it's not it Goodness requires me. a lot it requires mm -hmm. you to give a lot of yourself and you're doing it and you're doing it so effortlessly and so graciously so you know well done for all you do and you know I just pray that God continues to just lead you and guide you in, in the right direction really so yeah thank, thank you. you um so hi everyone like he said my name is Pam um, and today I'm going to be talking about childhood trauma and, and how it really impacts us, how it impacts our emotional and mental well-being, how it affects us in, in so many different ways. Um, some of you on here may have gone through some form of trauma growing up. Um, some of you may have experienced some form of trauma later on in life. Um, you know, when it really comes to trauma, by definition, trauma simply means an emotional response to a highly disturbing or distressing incident so any incident that happens whereby you're highly distressed and highly emotional about it it can be deemed as a traumatic incident um often at times when we talk about trauma the assumption is that somebody may have had to be abused in order to be traumatized and although that's an element of it this is not always the case people can be traumatized without going for abuse um so for example if somebody was to get into a car accident you know, there was no abuse there as such, but the incident in itself can be tra traumatizing, you know, and likewise, somebody can be abused and they don't necessarily have to be traumatized by that abuse if they get the right support at that stage of abuse, if they have the right network around them, if they get the right, you know, counseling and support network around them to help them process their emotions around the abuse, it doesn't need to lead to trauma. Um, but I think what I'm really going to be talking about today is, you know, trauma that has been caused by abuse, you know, in childhood growing up and how that really affects us. Um, so when we talk about abuse, then there are many different types of abuse, as you guys may be aware. You know, there's things like the physical abuse, which is the beating, the kicking. I grew up in Ghana. Gosh, I was hit with a belt. <laughs> I was hit with a tree branch. I was hit with a slipper in school. I got beaten. My nanny beat me all the time. But, you know, the funny thing is that back home, you don't really recognize that as abuse because that's not what the title is. The title for it is it's often branded under things like discipline and you know like i said you know people get physically abused all the time the slapping the hitting sometimes parents get frustrated and they pour out all their frustrations on you you know all these things can have a, a, a negative impact on your well-being on how you behave on on even how you see yourself you know you get things like the emotional and mental um, abuse so this is the name calling I know Lisa mentioned earlier as well you know people calling you outside your name saying things like you useless girl you foolish girl you know you don't know anything even though it may be said in passing these things actually hold value in our lives you know I think especially when you're growing up because when you're growing up you're at the stage of learning you know you're imitating things that you're seeing you're still in a stage of trying to figure out who you are who your identity is you know who am I and having all these name calling and these things and you're roughly even bullying at school and all these things these can also affect you and your mental well-being as well you know of course you've got things like sexual abuse so this is any form of unwanted sexual contact so as a child so this ranges from anything from gr um, grooming to groping to full-on you know rape of children um you know when it comes to sexual abuse it's, it's very broad because you can get child on child abuse you can also get you know abuse whereby there's an imbalance of power whereby a parent or a teacher or you know somebody who's much older abuses a child Again, often at times these things, it's not so much about the sex, but much more rather about the power. A lot of the times when you hear cases of um, rape and assault, it's mostly to do with the power that somebody has over somebody else. And of course, you get things like the neglect. So neglect really requires a combination of multiple things happening consistently over a period of time. So, for example, childhood neglect may be like a child going to school several times looking unkempt, maybe not eating, picking from the bins, you know, parents missing their injections, appointments, and, and all these things sort of a combination of things happening over and over again is often deemed as, you know, neglect. Um, obviously, you get things like um, 
domestic violence. Um, obviously, these are more geared towards adults, but you don't necessarily have had to experience domestic violence sort of physically done to you in order for you to be traumatized. Simply growing up in a home where there's violence or where there's toxic behaviors and, and things like that can also affect you as well. And, you know, it's, it's quite sad because, like I said earlier on, often at times when you're not supported to manage these things at a young age when they happen, they can lead into trauma. And the manifestations of that trauma looks very different for everybody. For some people, you know, it's dissociation. So this is when they subconsciously, you know, detach themselves from certain places, certain people, certain, you know, colours even, because that is their way of coping. And again, this is not even a conscious thing. But sometimes, you know, you may not like something. You don't even know why you don't like it. You may not like a certain colour and you don't even know why you like it. Maybe it's linked to the colour somebody who abused you was wearing. But because it's a subconscious thing, you, you are not really aware of it. You get things like, you know, transference. So this is where you may project your feelings towards your perpetrator onto somebody who you don't even know. But maybe that person wore the same glasses or maybe they walked a certain way. They had the same hair color as the abuser. So, again, you're projecting certain feelings onto them. You don't like them, but you don't really know them. You know, you get things like hypervigilance, whereby the person is so aware of what's happening on the outside that they're not really giving much attention to what's happening on the inside. And then the opposite of that is hypervigilance whereby people get so consumed in their emotions and what has happened to them that they're not even aware of what's happening externally. You know, with people like this, they may walk into oncoming traffic, um, even though they may see the car, they're not there because they're, they're here, they're in their minds, they're in themselves. Um, you know, you get things like flashbacks and these are intrusive images. Again, these are not conscious things. So, you know, you may be watching football and then, you know, you get, uh, an intrusive image of a time where you were abused and, and so on and so forth you know you get things like avoidance where people may avoid against specific places specific things and so on and so forth so when we talk about how trauma manifests itself like I said everybody the manifestation of trauma is very different from everybody you know somebody it may be flashbacks some people it may be things like panic attacks some people it may be isolation some people may be this and it may be that so everybody's reaction to trauma is very very different um but like i said trauma really affects so many different people and so many different young people but if the support were to be given right at the stages of the abuse it often doesn't need to go very very far um so when it actually comes to how trauma really affects the brain um, because i'm aware that sometimes we tend to blame ourselves for how we behave and we tend to question, oh, why am I like this? You know, why am I always behaving in this way? You know, even when I'm trying not to, I keep doing the same thing over and over again. I keep reacting to this person over and over again. Often at times we are very hard on ourselves and we tend to blame ourselves for a lot. But when you've gone through trauma, you know, there's actually a lot of chemical changes that happens in your brain. Um, and I've got a video that um, Lisa will probably be showing us a bit later on, which pretty much explains it. In, quite simple term but i think it's a really good video but imagine a part of your brain being in three sections right one of it is known as the amygdala and this is basically where adrenaline is produced so obviously if you're in danger you need adrenaline to know whether you're fighting you're flying <laughs> flying you're fighting you're freezing or you know you're running away but people for example who have experienced physical physical abuse over and over again because they're always on high alert sometimes they don't know how to bring that down so even in normal situations you may find them being very very defensive you know always trying to pick a fight even if you cast your mind back into school you may remember certain students who are always high fight who are always getting in trouble who are always fighting and, and so on and so forth often at times when you trace these back you can see that there's been some form of disruption within their brain while I was growing up you know you get things like the prefrontal cortex which is another part of your brain and its purpose is really to help you regulate your emotions but for example if you've been told that you're not good enough you're this you're this and you're that you're constantly going to be out trying to seek validation you know you don't know how to regulate your emotions you take things on so personally everything can be very very overwhelming for you you know you get the other one which is like i can never say it but it's like the nucleus 
accountants, I think I said it right. <laughs> and this one is mainly around things like your drive and need and motivation. And again, if you're if you're pleasing all the time because you're trying to get your parents to like you because of the abuse that you face with them, again, these can all affect you in adulthood. And I know Lisa mentioned it um, earlier as well, but you know, sometimes the mistake that we make is that once we get past that stage of childhood, we then assume that the problem also stopped <laughs> and stayed behind with us. But this is not always the case. And most of me, actually, it's, it's not always the case. Often at times when you're not supported to manage these traumas, they do follow you wherever you go. In adulthood, it can impact your future relationships. It impacts how you communicate with people. It impacts even how you sometimes manage your own family and even how you manage yourself and also how you view yourself as well. So there are so many different things that happens, but the reason why I wanted to briefly touch on trauma in the brain is really to help you understand that we have to learn to be a bit more kinder to ourselves. I think particularly when we're going through that process of healing because we tend to blame ourselves for a lot of things that sometimes we don't necessarily have control over. Sometimes it's to do with the chemicals in our brain. And, and you know, ideally there, there has to be a balance. But if there's been a disruption in, in terms of your upbringing, that balance is going to be off. And sometimes it, that, that is what causes you to behave a certain way and react to a certain thing in a certain way. So we do have to be very, very kind to ourselves when we go through the healing process. We, that's why often at times, when people have been traumatized and they're going through therapy, they often have to go back and revisit certain memories because, again, this goes back to reliving some of these events to rewire those changes in your brain to help you know that actually, you know, you know, you are a good person. What this person said about you isn't true. What they said about your identity actually isn't who you are. So it's about revisiting some of those memories to really rejig things and reshape things and reshape who you are as a person. So without being said, I'm just going to quickly let Lisa play the video, which is just going to briefly, start, I think it's only about five minutes, which is going to go a bit more into trauma in the brain, and then we're going to carry on uh, moving forward. All right. Let I me... hope I'm not talking too fast. I do tend to <laughs> talk. <laughs> you are fine. You are fine. You are fine. Let me just, okay. Okay. Okay, here we go. Yeah. I think we're struggling to hear it with the volume. Yeah, is it okay now? Mm -hmm. It's still a bit low. Um, I don't know how it is for everybody else. Mm. Yeah, it's still a bit low for me as well. As well. This is actually the loudest. Oh, okay. Okay. Share the link in the chat, sis, then we can watch it on our laptops and then resume. Okay.
Yeah, so a bit low. I think everyone's just probably going to um, try and watch on the laptops and then, yeah, okay. so I'll give it five minutes and then I'll start again. Okay. All right. Let me stop it. But I've sent the link in the chat so you ladies can watch in your own time. Pamela, over to you again. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that video really sums up, um, again, how you know, childhood trauma really has an impact on the brain and the different chemicals in the brain and how sometimes it causes you to behave and even act, even in, in terms of your social development. Like, you know, some people may struggle with things like anxiety, you know, things like just social awkwardness and, and just not really knowing how to communicate with people properly. And sometimes they blame themselves so much. Often at times, it's, it's, if you trace it back, it's due to something that is happening in your childhood that has rewired your brain to allow you to act a certain way. Um, so when it actually comes to trauma, like Lisa said, the impact on our adult relationships actually is something that happens. Um, you know, in some cases, some people can be overly dependent because they have trust issues and they, they can't trust people. Um, in cases of sexual abuse, um, you may find some people are very, very promiscuous, they're very out there. Um, but unfortunately, the mistake that we make, particularly within the BME community, is that we just assume that they're naughty or they're just overly sexualized. Often at times when you see people like that, for them, it's about, again, control because their choice were taken away when they were younger, because their, their control were taken away when they were younger. This is their way of having control and choose. And actually, instead of you hurting me, I can choose who to hurt. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? You find mm -hmm. people, again, just being in relationships with people, not necessarily out of love, but again, to, to hurt other people as well. Um, and of course, like Lisa said as well, that generational thing of, of how maybe parenting, how you have been parented. Um, you also have that as well. You get people who drink quite a lot, take drugs, go clubbing, do all sorts, just to really manage their trauma. It's all right when they're in public, but when they're alone, the isolation, this is really when their minds start to play back to what's happening to them and so on and so forth. And, and as a result of that, they may start drinking, smoking and just really getting involved with certain behaviours that may end up harming them. Of course, you've got the self-harm as well. So this is the cutting, this is the pulling of the eyelashes, this is pinching themselves, burning themselves with smoke, you know, with... Um, with deodorant sprays as well. There are so many different ways that people self-harm themselves. And often at times when it comes to self-harm, it stems from things like emotional abuse as well, not believing that they're good enough. So the harm on them for them doesn't mean anything because I'm not good enough anyway. This harm doesn't do anything. Um, for some people on the flip side, self-harm is a way of coping because they can't feel any pain because they've been so traumatized they can't feel any pain they can't feel anything so by cutting myself even though it's a physical pain at least I can feel something so you know there are so many different ways that people you know like I said are affected when it comes to trauma of course you've got things like the anxiety a lot of young people the young young people are suffering with anxiety and um, things like panic attacks, you get things like depression, you get things like the PTSDs, you get things like borderline personality disorder. This is where people take on, again, this is all subconscious, this is where people take on multiple personalities outside of themselves to help them manage what they've gone through. Um, I was watching a show um, a while ago, I think it's called Norman Bates, I can't, no, Bates may tell, and it's about this young person and the mum, something traumatic. Trauma, um, traumatizing happening when he was a young person there was a lot of violence in the home so he ended up killing the dad and as a result of that every time that he commits a crime he switches into somebody else he switches into his mom so often at times because his mom was his protector at the time so with things like borderline personality disorder you find people having these different personalities that almost protects their younger self um, and of course this could be one personality to like I said multiple personalities some people have over 50 personalities and if you can imagine that that must be very exhausting because a person isn't aware some people are trained almost to feel a new personality forming but other people don't and it will be very very exhausting living on this earth knowing that you know, other personalities have access to your mind, to your behaviours, 
to your communication in a way that you are not even aware. You know, you may see somebody and say something to you that wasn't you, but to them, it's like, oh, but you just you just said that to me. So that in itself brings about so many different stresses and just just tiredness and just I could just imagine people just feeling emotionally drained. You know, so when it comes to abuse and trauma, like I said, in terms of our mental health and mental well-being, it affects us in so many different ways. But I think the good news is that there is help available. But me, myself, I'm a Christian, and I know um, Lisa mentioned a bit about Christianity to begin with. I think one of my biggest frustrations with the church um, is that we don't often address difficult topics. We don't talk about difficult conversations. We don't talk about the abuse happening within the church. We don't talk about the abuse that people bring into the church. Um, and as a result of that, we're almost living this life whereby it's all nice and rosy, but actually people are really resenting God. People are really questioning, well, Lord, I serve you. Why did this happen to me? You know, people don't feel free to be able to speak about it. Again, going back to what Lisa said, as well, oftentimes in churches and in our homes growing up, particularly within bank communities, there is this idea that you don't talk about what happens in a family. What happens in the same family stays in the family. And I had personal experiences of this growing up as well. And, and we don't really understand that impact that it has on people growing up. You know, it's not just about not being able to say that's really communicating to any child that your voice doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what is important to you. You don't talk about it. Why? Because your voice doesn't matter. So even later on, when there is support services available for them, you find them being fearful to be able to get that support because they keep getting that. You don't talk about what's happening in the family. Instead of them to focus on their healing, they think, well, what's my mom going to say about this? What's my dad going to say about this? And, you know, when you're not healed, again, that really travels with you. It becomes a cycle um, sometimes as well. So when it comes to supports available, there is many different types of therapy. Um, and again, sometimes the mistake that we make is that when we try one form of therapy and it doesn't work for us, we just assume that therapy doesn't work. Um, it's about individual needs. It's about finding some form of therapy that is tailored to you and your needs. Um, for some people, sitting there and talking to a counsellor doesn't work because they're struggling to or they struggle to articulate their, their emotions um, through verbal communication. You know, try creative therapy, try art therapy, try dance therapy, try drama therapy, try music therapy. You know, you could even try things like self-help types of therapies, like creative journaling as well. Um, you know, for some people, they try aromatherapy, which is the use of pure essential oils which derive from plants as a way of healing they put it in their candles they have it in their house in their pillow mist because it's said that these different scents bring about calming um, different things as well um, so when it comes to support available there is many different ones and if you've tried talking and talking doesn't work don't give up <laughs> you know try something else there is something available for you you just need to find what works for you um, but like I said earlier, well, I'm a Christian as well, so I'm a firm believer that in all things that happen in life, we must not only deal with it physically, but we also must tackle it spiritually because we are spiritual beings. The Bible talks about how we have been created in the image of God. In the book of John, it says that God is a spirit. So if God is a spirit and we've been created in his image, that means that we are also spirits. We are spirits with a soul living a human or physical experience. Mm -hmm. So if something has happened to you physically, yes, deal with it physically by getting therapy, but also deal with it spiritually because a huge part of you is a spirit as well. I hope I'm making sense in saying that. Um, so, yeah, I believe that, you know, praying is definitely key. You know, get in a prayer, get people that you trust around you. You cannot underestimate the power of prayer. You know, the, the Bible in itself actually talks about healing. There are many people in the Bible who suffered mental health problems. But again, we don't talk about this in church. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, a, I believe there was a king who actually, his condition was very rare. He ended up living in in a forest with animals that was his mental health conditions there are people like david there are people like jeremiah who really pour out their heart to god saying god why was i even born i hate the day i was born that sounds like depression to me that sounds like modern day depression to me that sounds like modern day anxiety to me so even when we look into the bible there is so many different people who struggled and even just just think about the lives that they lived, the persecution that a lot of them faced, you know, as a result of choosing to follow Christ. They they struggled a lot. 
but God always provided them with healing. So likewise, as well as dealing with it physically, we should always seek to deal with it spiritually. The reason I say this is that, for example, um, this is, yeah, um, yeah. So the reason why I say this, for example, is that if, let's say you're in the kitchen cooking, right, and you cut yourself and it's bleeding, what do you do? Do you say a prayer or do you get a plaster to cover it? Most likely get a plaster to cover it, cover it. Why? Because that is a physical wound. Do you see what I mean? So it requires physical interventions. So likewise, when we go through all these abuse and traumas, as well as being spiritual beings, and like I said, dealing with it in a spiritual manner, there's also physical intervention that is required. You know, somebody may be got a headache. You know, some people may pray. Somebody may take paracetamol. There's nothing wrong with that. God has given us the, wind of, the wisdom to be able to create these interventions to help us. So some people just, they don't really understand. I'll probably put it in that way. Um, you know, when it comes to the things of God, they just assume that everything is spiritual and, you know, everything has to be dealt with within the spirit. And although I do agree to a certain extent, because I do believe that the spirit, what happens in the spirit is, you know, sometimes is what we see in the physical. It starts in the spirit. Again, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about how um, through what was unseen, what is now seen has been created. So there are a lot of things that happen spiritually and the overflow of that is what we see in the physical realm. But there are also things that require physical um, interventions as well. So yeah, like I said, pray about it. Find yourself a group of women. If you're a man on here, find yourself a group of men, just a group of people who you trust. You can even get Christian counselors as well, who can not only give you spiritual guidance, but can also help you with the practical level of things. But I think even just before I round up, because I'm aware that my time is pretty much ended, is that one of the things when it comes to the spirit and when it comes to trauma and abuse and all these horrible and horrific things that we've gone through is, is forgiveness and I talk about forgiveness every time I have the opportunity to talk about forgiveness I talk about it and the reason being is that I have lived it I have lived the life of unforgiveness and I have also lived the life of forgiveness and I'll choose forgiveness all the time you cannot underestimate the power of forgiveness forgiveness is never for you sorry it's never for the other person it's always for you Mm. often at times when we're hurt by the people we love or people who we trusted people who we trust us to look after us to protect us and they hurt us you know it really hurts because you put all your trust in them you trusted them to protect you and they they basically violated you so often at times forgiving them can feel as though you're just letting them get away with things or maybe it may make you look like a pushover but actually forgiveness is for you because a lot of the time, the people who have hurt you, they're there living their best life, doing hot boy summer, hot girl summer, sleeping and snoring. You're the one still hurting. You're the one who can't sleep. Unforgiveness, guys, it can change your identity. And I'm saying this because I know it. I have lived it, you know, and maybe one day I might get the opportunity to share my testimony again. But when I was growing up, my mom accused me of sleeping with her partner. And, you know, there were so many different chaos that happened and I held on forgiveness in my heart towards her for over five years and within that five years guys I was miserable I didn't know who I was sometimes I wake up just feeling angry my response to people wasn't necessarily pleasant and God took me through a whole journey of learning about forgiveness which is really in my first book that I talk about because I'm, I'm a, just a huge advocate for forgiveness but even when it comes to forgiveness even though it's a spiritual concept, because when you don't forgive, what happens is that you're leaving or you're allowing access um, for other things into your heart. You're giving the enemy basically a gateway to bring things like bitterness, to bring things like envy, to bring things like jealousy. But not even only that, but also there's a lot of research to show that unforgiveness can affect you physically. You know, things like high blood pressure, things like, you know, heart diseases, things like long term chronic illnesses. All of these things are linked to unforgiveness. So when I talk about forgiveness being a spiritual concept, we also have to be mindful that it can also benefit us physically as well. So when it comes to abuse and trauma, like I said, as, as well as dealing with things in a physical realm, we also must deal with it spiritually and we can always start with forgiveness. But even just to encourage anybody on here who may have experienced any form of trauma growing up, I want you to know that, you know, healing is possible. You know, it may take some time, but you will get there. You just need to be patient with yourself. You know, 
just know that you've got a helper who's the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you just to guide you through the process. You know, ask for help. That's very important. Don't bottle it up. Don't think you can manage it alone because often at times you can't. The issue with holding things in your head is that you go around so many different times that sometimes you amplify the problem. But, you know, there's a saying that says that a problem, a problem shared is a problem halved. You know, often at times when you share it with somebody, what you're going through, you may not necessarily share for answers, but share it so the load is less on you. But ask for help. And, you know, and like I said, when you try one form of therapy and it doesn't work, don't give up. Do not give up. Try something else. Keep trying until you find the right one, because your healing is very important. Your healing will influence your future relationships. Your healing may influence your parenting skills. Your healing will influence how you relate to other people. Most importantly, your healing is often linked to your purpose. You need to be able to heal. And, you know, often at times as well, when it comes to childhood trauma and abuse, and this took me a while to get here. And I've now come to understanding that everything that I go through, no matter how horrible it is, I don't take it on personally anymore. And the reason being is that I have come to understand is that God has given me an assignment. And in order for me to fulfill the assignment, I need experience. How can I talk to somebody about unforgiveness when I've never been hurt before? You know, how can I talk to somebody about sexual abuse and really help them pick themselves back up again if I've never gone through that? How can I talk to somebody about this if you haven't gone through that? But like I said, it took me a very, very long time to get here. But I want you to know that even though it feels very, very personal, there is a reason for it, you know, and it takes time. But once you get to that place where you understand it, it does get easier, you know, when things happen. You don't feel so burdened about it because you realize that it's only for a season. And the good thing with seasons is that they don't last forever. Seasons pass. So whatever you're going through today, I just want to encourage you knowing that it's just a season. It will pass. You will get to a place where you are better again. You're going to get to a place where you can only see yourself outside of who you were. I'm now at a place where I still have my story. I still have my testimony. Everything that happened to me still affected me. But I'm now at a place where I can almost remove myself from who I was and say, Pam, you've come far by the grace of God. Pam, you had to go through this in order to help somebody else. So yeah, I just want to encourage you in saying that. So thank you so much, guys. I know I've got a bit over time by six minutes. But yeah, I I do hope that I I gave out as much information as, as I can. And if you have any questions, then please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Ooh. This was really, are. really good. Wow. Yeah. Let's give her a round of very, very good. You are. 